Euh, pour commencer cet après-midi, je vais accueillir sur scène euh, une personne qui est membre du conseil consultatif de la Queen Mary University of London, co-auteur du March Cloud Risk Framework White Paper et spécialiste du droit informatique. Elle va venir nous parler des écueils que doivent éviter les logiciels. Je vous demande d'accueillir Madame Amanda Brock. So uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming back from your lunch break. Uh, my name is Amanda Brock, and I'm here this afternoon as a European representative of the Open Invention Network. Um, it's hard to see you all in this light, but let's see if you're awake after lunch. How many of you work for communities, participate in communities or projects or companies that are either a licensee or a member of the Open Invention Network? Put your hands in the air. Okay, not many of you, one or two. How many of you know what the Open Invention Network is? Great, more of you. So for those of you that don't, the Open Invention Network is a defensive patent pool. It's a patent non-aggression organization which helps to protect Linux against patent enforcement and aggression. It was set up more than 10 years ago by six member companies, including IBM, NEC, Sony, and Red Hat. And as well as those six founding members, there's a seventh member, Google, and associate members, Canonical and TomTom. Tom. So what that organization does is those founding members and members have pledged not just financially, but their patents. And those patents are available to licensees as well as to the members. And a licensee becomes a free member, a free licensee rather, of OIN by committing the same thing the members have. And that commitment is that where you have patents that read on a Linux definition, you will not enforce those patents against anyone else who is signed up. So it's a collective defensive organization where people make patent commitments to each other to help protect them from patent aggression in Linux. So you know who I'm speaking for today and what I'm about. And what I'm here to talk to you about is trolls, patent trolls, and how we manage them. Now, I've got a very short period of time and quite a lot of slides, so I'm going to go a little bit more quickly than I would like, and I'm speaking English to you, so if I'm not understandable, wave your hand in the air or ask me questions at the end. So how many of you know what this means? I-A-A-L, four-letter acronym. Anybody know? I am a lawyer. Um, not always well received when you say that to people, but I am a lawyer. And you're probably all more familiar with seeing a five-letter acronym, I-A-N-A-L, but I am not a lawyer, but here is my very clever, very considered opinion on the law. And that will often come from the smart developers we all work with. So let's see if you're still awake. Who in the room is a developer? Great few developers. Business people? Okay, lawyers? Ooh, good, not many lawyers. Who knows about patents? A few of you. Who knows a lot about patents? One of you, you've probably been sued. So, 20 years ago, when I was a young lawyer, I didn't think patents were at all relevant to what I wanted to do. I wanted to work in software. So I didn't study them, and I didn't train in them. And today, I am a lawyer, but this is not legal advice. And one of the reasons is that I wouldn't say I was a patent expert. I didn't study it. I don't practice patent law day in, day out. But what's happened over those 20 years is that many large organizations have had plenty of money, plenty of funding, and plenty of clever lawyers who've registered patents for them in the software space, a space that I didn't think you really could have patents in 20 years ago. And you'll see from my slide, last year in the US alone, there were 300,000 software patents registered, not applied for, but registered. And that's a huge amount. So you can imagine, over 20 years, how many patents have been registered in the US and in Europe that affect software. So whether I want to be a patent lawyer or not, I have to know a bit about patents. And anybody who wants to work in the software space these days has to know about them. Partly because of the number of patents, but also partly because of patent suits. Uh, do any of you know what NPEs are? Non-practicing entities, patent trolls. 
These are businesses which make their money out of patents, but they don't operate a business that they use those patents in. They purely hold the patents to leverage the value of patent licensing. So they don't operate a software business or anything like it, but they will approach you to generate revenue from their patents by you paying them licensing fees. You can see from my slide, 2011, 80 billion dollars, 80 US billion dollars of wealth was lost by businesses. Now that's collectively. For any individual business that's sued, you're looking at spending several million dollars on a lawsuit. You may have damages awarded against you. And more importantly, you're going to have massive business disruption, particularly if you're in the US where there's a huge discovery process that's very invasive and very time consuming. And it's not just the, the money that the MPEs cost, it's the number of suits that's affecting all of us. You can see from this slide in 2012, it's on the up and up, and since then it's continued to increase. And it's not just increasing because the trolls, the, the NPEs, are making money out of it. It's increasing for a number of other reasons. And one of those reasons is that the trolls with their lucrative marketplace, the NPEs, are not simply approaching software companies and suing software companies. They're looking at the wider ecosystem and seeing, you, you will all have seen this with Android, they didn't attack Google instantly. Google wasn't the first target. What they did was go after the wider ecosystem, the companies and the organizations that were end users or were distributing the Google Android product. And that's one good example of it. And from my slide, you'll see 40% of cases that are now being brought aren't against the makers, aren't against the software developers, but they're against this ecosystem. And it's increasing and increasing. Oh, I've switched it off. Help. So, as that increases, it's not surprising, thank you, I can break anything, um, it's not surprising that it's not just the trolls who are bringing these lawsuits. Big companies who were smart enough to register those patents over 20 years, who were smart enough to build up big portfolios, can use those defensively, but they can also use them aggressively. And if they have the same opportunity as the MPEs and the trolls to generate large amounts of money out of them, well, they're in business, why wouldn't they? So what we're seeing more and more of is companies that would use their patents operationally actually selling those to subsidiaries in their business, sometimes specifically setting up a subsidiary so that that subsidiary can enforce the patents on a troll-like, NPE-like model. And it also means that when it comes to litigation against those organizations, the operational company has defensive advantages. But operationally, where large corporations have made rand and frand, reasonable and non-discriminatory commitments on those patents, they may not have to honor them if they're moved into a separate business and that business goes about being a patent troll. Now, some would say that in Europe we've been a bit sleepy. We've thought it was okay, we were safe in our beds. But there are now patent trolls in Europe. And um, I read something maybe a week or two ago from INAV, one of the patent monetization organizations. And their founder was saying that he likes to bring suits in Europe these days, not in the US. So we're not safe from suits being brought in Europe. And we're not safe because we're European companies or entities. And the reason for that is that companies choose, companies who want to enforce patents choose specific jurisdictions, specific countries or states that are patent friendly, where they're more likely to succeed in litigation. If you've seen patent litigation, uh, Texas, the Eastern District, and uh, Germany are favorite places to bring patent suits. I'm told by colleagues who do a lot of legal work in Texas enforcing patents or defending them that the hotels there are fantastic. And they're fantastic because so many lawyers go there to spend weeks on end and millions of dollars defending and pursuing these claims. So I can only assume that Germany is going to follow a similar model. But it's not just the trolls and the companies behaving like trolls. What we're also seeing is anti-competitive suits. If you happen to have a nice patent portfolio, that's a very good way of attacking your competitors. You've probably all heard about the fat patents Microsoft holds and the attack they made on TomTom. Tom. It's a great way of seeing someone else in the marketplace come into the marketplace and try and stop them from competing with you to assert your patents. The other thing we're seeing more and more of, and it's very similar behavior, is cross-licensing. 
where companies with patent portfolios will approach smaller, younger companies and say to them, uh, not in the friendliest of ways, but say to them, hey, you're infringing my patents, but you've got some patents I would like. Give me a license to your patents and I won't see you on mine. And that gives these larger companies more and more power where they are pretty much immune from being sued. Now, I'm going to go through this because I've only got a few minutes left quite quickly. The US has been the main historic place for patent um, enforcement suits. And the US courts are becoming a bit more aware, having more of a clue about patents. So cases like Acme, where they said no to contributory infringement, Biosigvid Natalis, where they said there's no such thing as too much indefiniteness, Sovereign and Newig, where they said it's a really tough time to be a patent owner. And I guess the most important of those cases are from the Supreme Court, Alice versus CLS Bank, which was held last June. And in that, we pretty much got a decision that there's no more magical patentability on a computer. But these cases are ongoing in the US. They're not going to stop. And only yesterday, a colleague emailed me this new case, Card Verification Solutions, where the defense is that an abstract concept and is asserted in the patent and therefore does not contain patentable subject matter. You can go away and look at these cases, you can have your lawyers look at them, they will be helpful to your business to understand. But I think it's more important to have a general understanding of what's going on, to understand the troll marketplace, how practicing entities are behaving like trolls also, and that you may be attacked and if you're attacked what to do. So how do we respond? Um, I've got two slides here and they sort of are separate but not. The first one's about community and corporate responses. So you can enter into non-aggression packs, you can think about your ecosystem and agree collectively that you're not going to sue each other and participate. You have to think about antitrust concerns, but you can do that. LOT is a Google concept, license on transfer. It's a very clever idea where when they sell a patent, it will be encumbered. It, it will have a, a restriction which the purchaser has to honor. And that restriction is that you cannot then use the patent to sue someone in the future in an open source space. You can join something like OIN, a defensive patent pool. You can also use the GPL for your software. Um, one of the benefits of the GPL is the patent provisions in it mean that you give a patent license and that's clear and definite and that will pass down the line in a cascading or waterfall effect so everybody who takes your software and redistributes it on the GPL will have to make the same patent commitments. We can also lobby and many of us have been lobbying or responding to actions through the European Commission and through the ITC etc in the US, the DOJ for a long time and it can be frustrating because for every person lobbying on our side there's someone lobbying for the uh, non-practicing entities and the patent aggressors. In terms of individual activities in some way they're much the same. One thing that really is worth pointing out is prior art. If you're a patent examiner and you are working in the patent office, when you look at a patent application, you only have a couple of resources to check for prior art. And those resources are websites. To get your development, your software, onto those websites, it has to be in a particular form and you have to know what they are. Now, if anybody's interested in more information on that or how to do it, please contact me because OIN can help you with that. Um, but it's very important because the examiners won't know about prior art beyond that and in the US in particular it's difficult to challenge patents once they've granted. You can do the same sort of lobbying thing, you can tell your lawmakers why it's a problem for you that software patents exist or are used aggressively and you can do what I'm doing today, you can talk to friends and colleagues and spread the word. So what I know about myself, the general public, and probably everybody here who's had a good lunch is that we've all got a low attention span, seven seconds like a goldfish probably. So I've given you some resources in the slides and I would remind you that, that the point of the talk today is to explain to you that patent trolls are a live issue, companies are behaving more and more in troll-like ways. You may well receive either um, potential litigation requests, requests across license, um, NDAs, things like that from patent aggressors and that it's important to respond in a sensible way and to know where you can go to get um, resources to help you with that response. Now I'm being flashed at here, I don't know if that means I, I don't have any time for questions but just be aware of the trolls under the bridge. Thank you, Amada.